All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Isaiah chapter 41. We're going to see the glory of God over the coastlands here. We'll just jump into the first verse. Keep silence before me, O coastlands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together for judgment. So the Hebrew word translated coastlands is also translated islands or isles in other passages, such as in chapters 11 and 40. It's also translated with broader words like territory in passages like Isaiah chapter 20, verse 6. The idea is possibly um, best expressed as distant lands. And so here God is calling to all nations, even the distant lands, to keep silent before him. Uh, why? Because they're coming to God's courtroom, right? And so Isaiah chapter 40 had just promised that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. But here God's going to advise the people in distant lands who don't know him to renew their strength as they come into his courtroom. So if you're going to contest with God, you better be prepared. And so God's going to allow the idol worshipers of all the world to come before him and justify their idolatry. They're going to have the opportunity to speak, though they have to enter his courtroom in silence out of respect for his majesty. Uh, some of the reasons for the silence here is shame, attention, or maybe even submission. Uh, any of these would be a good reason to be silent in the Lord's presence in his courtroom. Verses 2-4, through four, God's going to reason with the coastlands. Who raised up one from the east, who in righteousness called him to his feet, who gave him the nations before him, and made him rule over kings, who gave them as the dust to his sword, as driven stubble to his bow, who pursued them and passed safely, by the way that he had not gone with his feet, who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. I the Lord am the first, and with the last I am he. So God questions the idolaters from the distant lands and asks them who authored this important event in human history, who raised up one uh, from the east. And some commentators will debate the identity of the one from the east. A lot of people will believe it's uh, Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people and the father of the faithful, or Cyrus, the king who joined the Medes and the Persians in, fighting, uh, in the fighting force which conquered Babylon. Some will explain it of Abraham, others of Cyrus, um, because the, of the character of the righteous man or righteousness agrees better with Abraham than it did with Cyrus. And it could be a, diff a difficult decision between the two, uh, and I guess depending on how you look at it, either answer can be correct according to the context, but it's probably best to see the one from the east as Abraham because of the word of the Lord later in the chapter where it says in verse 22, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were. And God appeals to idols and their worshipers and asks them to tell both the future and the past. Since Cyrus is mentioned in verse 25, I've raised up one from the north and from the rising of the sun. He's the figure that shows God's knowledge of the future. So Abraham is the figure that shows God's knowledge of the past. So past and future with the present sandwiched in between all belong to the Lord our God. And so as God invites those in the distant lands to come and reason with him, he's going to show his greatness over all creation and over all history. And they're going to ask themselves who's in control of the course of human events. Right, And this is always a relevant question. Is there a point, a direction to human history? Is it just random, meaningless combination of undirected events? Or is it a cycle fated to repeat itself endlessly? Or is there a God in heaven who directs human events, always moving to a final resolution and fulfillment? And our answer to this question influences almost everything in our lives, uh, literally. And so here, the Lord God of Israel declares that he has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. He lifts up and puts down the kings of the nations. He's the first and the last. He's the bookend both before and after the saga of human history, starting the story and ending the story, keeping the whole story together. And if God's both the first and the last, he also has the authority over everything in between. And this means that there absolutely is a plan of God for human history, and he directs the path of human events towards his design fulfillment. Our lives are not given over to blind fate, to random meaninglessness, or to endless cycles with no resolution. 
So Jesus takes the same title of the first and the last in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, and chapter 22, verse 13. If the Lord is the first and the last, according to Isaiah 41, verse 4, and if Jesus is the first and the last, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, and chapter 22, verse 13, then uh, since there cannot be two first or two last, Jesus must be the Lord God. All right, verse 5 through 7. So the coastland saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid. They drew near and came. Everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with a hammer inspired him who strikes the anvil, saying, Is it ready for the soldering? Then he fastened it with pegs that it might not totter. So when they met this God of all authority and power, they feared. They were brought so low by this encounter with God that they had to encourage one another to go on. And this is a logical reaction. It's the same kind of reaction Peter had when he saw the great power of Jesus in Luke chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, so what did they do um, with the fear that they felt after their encounter with God? They let the fear drive them away from the true God instead of surrendering to this God of glory and majesty and power. They turned from God and made for themselves idols. And so Isaiah here is pouring on the irony here. Verse 8 and 9. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions, and said to you, You are my servant, and I have chosen you and have not cast you away. So in contrast to the God-rejecting and idol-making people in distant lands, Israel, remember the name means governed by God, Israel is the servant of the Lord. And a servant of God would never make God into his own image, his own idea of what God should be. Servants don't tell their masters what to do or what to be. Servants know who the master is and who the servant is. <clears throat> and Israel is twice addressed as servant or rendered literally slave, that is to say a person without position or rights. And uh, lest Israel becomes proud, God's going to pop their swelling quickly. If they are Israel, governed by God, then they are also Jacob, conniving, untrusty uh, conman. And so they are only the servant of God because he's chosen them. And so Israel stood in this place, uh, the descendants of Abraham, because of their family relationship to Abraham. Since Abraham was a friend of God, so his descendants had a special place before God as well. Jehoshaphat knew Abraham was a friend of God in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. James knew that Abraham was a friend of God in James chapter 2, verse 23. We are also friends of God, not because of our relation to Abraham, but because of our relation to the Son of God, Jesus. In John chapter 15, verses 14 and 15, it says, You, Jesus speaking, are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. All right, so again, Israel's special place before God is because of God's initiative, not because of Israel's achievement. Israel is different from the idol makers in distant lands because of God's work in them, not because of their own greatness. Verses 10 through 13. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you and those who war against you shall be as nothing as a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. So this is both a command and a promise. Israel is commanded to fear not. Fear, worry, and anxiety are often a sin. When the God who rules over the nations, as described in Isaiah 41, verses 2-4, through 4, the God who chose us and loves us, as described in Isaiah 41, verses 8 and 9, when that God tells us to fear not, then we have to take it seriously. But there is also a promise. We fear not because the Lord has told us, I am with you. What more do we need? If God is for us, then who can be against us? In Romans chapter 8, verse 31. So, he said, Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And it's as if God said to his people, Remember me, the, you know, the God of all the power and glory. I'm that God. I'm your God. Um... And yeah, 
J.B. Phillips wrote a book titled Your God is Too Small, and he showed that how when people forget the greatness of God, they easily become dismayed. Because, But God says, be not dismayed, for I am your God. And so God's strength and glory make him able to help us, but it's his love that makes him say, I will help you. <clears throat> Idols have to be fastened with pegs so they don't totter over. You have to hold them up, but God instead holds us up, right? You, sh you should never have a God that you have to hold up. Idolaters hold a God in their hands that they make with their hands, but our God holds us in his hand. <laughs> so there's a big difference. And so, knowing this, we see a terrible nature of fear and unbelief in these pagan, you know, idol worshippers. And God's going to deal with our enemies if we keep our trust in God. And He knows how to make our adversaries, whether they are men or devils, ashamed and disgraced. And uh, behold, all those who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced is in part an outworking of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. God has always crushed anti-Semitic nations and movements, and in the reign of the Messiah, he's going to crush them completely. And so... In Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, God promised to uphold you with my righteous right hand. And that was God's hand holding us up. Now we see God's hand holding our right hand and giving us strength over fear, doubt, and our adversaries. Alright, verse 14 through 16. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold... I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth, and you shall thresh the mountains and beat them small, and make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord, and glory in the Holy One of Israel. So the idea of a worm is connected to the name Jacob, but the idea of men is connected with the name Israel. And so the name Jacob, as applied to Israel here, always points back when Israel is uh, being deceitful, so that it is by no means an honor. Uh, your Redeemer here, that's the familiar word that we all know of, the kinsman Redeemer, the Goel from uh, Isaiah 35 and also the book of Ruth. This is the next of kin who takes upon himself the people's needs as if they were his own. That was key to understanding the book of Ruth and really key when you understand that Jesus Christ is our kinsman Redeemer, our Goel. And so God will help Israel and empower them so that they're going to cut down the mountains uh, as if they were a great threshing machine, removing mountains and seeing their dust blown away. The point is clear. Nothing, not even a mountain, will stand in their way when God helps them. And Jesus expressed the same idea in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, where he says, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And so when we overcome great obstacles with the help of the Lord, we know it's His work, not ours. We rejoice in the Lord, not in ourselves. We glory in the Holy One of Israel, not in ourselves. It's not us. The only reason we have anything good coming out of us is because He's working through us. But it's His doing, regardless. Verses 17 through 20. Fear not, God has abundant resources. Verse 17. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open up rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. And I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. All right. So, in response to the cry of the poor needy, those whose tongues fail for thirst, God's going to send miraculous supplies of water for them. And God has resources and supplies that we know nothing about. And he loves to supply us from his own hidden resources. And he's also going to make these barren places fruitful, uh, full of beautiful forests. And uh, God can pretty much do whatever he wants, right? He can take the most barren wilderness and make it a forest if he wants to. Uh, if he can make the universe in six days, then <laughs> he can take a barren wasteland and turn it to a forest if he so pleases. And so when it all takes place, everybody's going to know this, uh, that the hand of the Lord has done it. Uh, miraculous supplies of water and forest in the wilderness are, you know, impossible without God. 
and he gets the glory when that happens. All right, verse 21, uh, God's going to call the idols and their worshipers on to trial here in his little courtroom. All right, verse 21, present your case, says the Lord, bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. So God is fair. He will not condemn idols, the false god of the nations, and those who worship them without a fair trial. So he invited these idols and their worshipers to come and present their case. All right, let's hear your side of the story. Let's hear your best arguments. And this is the only place in the Bible where God uses the title King of Jacob. Um, but the title King of Israel is used 138 times in the Bible, mostly of men. But the Lord God in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 15, and Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 49, and uh, John chapter 12, verse 13. <clears throat> so coming out of verse 22 through 24, God's going to examine the defendants, the idols, and their worshipers at this trial. Verse 22. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination." So God's going to invite the idols to present your case in Isaiah 41, verse 21. But none is presented. And the next words uh, are God's questioning of the idols. Uh, but why don't the idols present their case and defend themselves? Uh, because they're dumb statues that can't speak, obviously. So the questioning moves on. And God's going to examine the defendants. And basically, if these idols are really, you know, gods, then they're certainly going to know the future and the past. Let them speak up. God knows these things, don't they? Um, and so, do it that we may know that you are gods. And of course, they can't. So, it's as if God stands in a courtroom questioning a thousand idols of all different sizes and designs and finally cries out, do something, do good or do evil. Can't you do anything? But they can't do anything, so the accusation is made based upon the evidence. Your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. And today, idolatry is still an abomination. Those few bow down to statues. Many still fashion a god of their own opinion. Where, whatever you decide, just make one up. And uh, decide that that's the god that they're going to respect. Even many churchgoers do this today. Surprisingly enough, the spiritual conflict experienced today is exactly the same nature and of the same character as you find depicted right here. The issue is still unsettled in, this, in the minds of men, though it is settled eternally in the mind of God. The world is making every effort to put the best possible show upon its worship of the creature rather than the creator. And its worship is more than the patronizing of a shell of religion, than bowing in submission before an empty cross and occupied throne and the king of kings in glory and so paul quoted the idea in first corinthians chapter 8 verse 4 when he wrote therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other god but one <clears throat> verse 25 through 29 we're going to see the lord's summary here idols are worthless and man is limited verse 25 I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun, he shall call on my name. And he shall come against princes as though mortar, as potter treads clay. Who has declared from the beginning that we may know, and former times that we may say he is righteous? Surely there is no one who shows, and surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. The first time I said to Zion, Look, there they are, and I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings. For I looked, and there was no man. And I looked among them, but there was no counselor. Who, when I asked of them, could answer a word? Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. So, in contrast to the idols who can tell nothing of the future, the Lord knows... Uh, he knows that he'll bring Cyrus from the north to conquer the Babylonians who conquered Judah and Jerusalem and took them captive. God was going to use Cyrus to allow the Jews in exile to return. And Cyrus had the greatest respect for Jehovah. And we can read his proclamation concerning the freeing of Israel in Ezra chapter 1. 
Uh, in it, he states correctly that Jehovah had given him all the kingdoms of the earth. <clears throat> so, finally, the verdict is read at the trial, and apart from God, in the grand scheme of things, all the greatness of man is worthless, and all the great works are nothing. <laughs> This reminds me of Ecclesiastes, right? Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. And what of the idols? Their molded images are wind and confusion. So this chapter is the great I will chapter of the Bible. No fewer than 14 times of the scope of these verses does God reinforce his authority with the promise I will. He says, I will strengthen you in verse 10. I will help you in verse 10, 13, and 14. I will uphold you with my righteous hand in verse 10. I will make you a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth, verse 15. I will open rivers and desolate heights, verse 18. I will make a wilderness a pool of water, verse 18. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, verse 19. And I will set in the desert the cypress tree, verse 19. And I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings, in verse 27. And this is a remarkable contrast with Isaiah's 14, the five I will uh, statements of Satan and here are the I will statements of Satan I will ascend into heaven in Isaiah 14 at verse 13 I will exalt my throne above the stars of God verse 13 I will also sit on the mount of the congregation I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high verse 14 of Isaiah 14. And so the I will statements of Satan were proud and self-directed. Every I will of the Lord is for the benefit and blessing of his people. And though Satan was lifted up in pride and proclaimed I will, none of it came to pass. But each and every one of God's I will statements will be fulfilled. So when God says I will, he says it with all the authority of omnipotence. He has foreseen every difficulty, he's seen every choice, every decision, he's studied every obstacle which can come in his way, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's anticipated every possible contingency, he, sh he knows the weakness of the one to whom he makes his promise, and yet he still says, I will. All right, praise God. And that's Isaiah chapter 41. Next time we'll get into chapter 42. Thank you for joining me.